lecture today is um, on coating technologies. Um, and we'll focus on uh, coating technologies for cold rolled uh, sheet products mainly. Um, coatings are very important for steel uh, in that they prevent um, corrosion uh, to occur in uh, sheet products. Um, in fact, uh, one of the reasons for the sustained success of coated uh, sheet uh, of, of sh uh, steel sheet in uh, certain applications as the automotive industry uh, is in part, great part due to the fact that these products can be um, made um, corrosion resistance by the applications of suitable coatings. Um, and similar developments have happened in uh, the use of coated sheet for uh, uh, building and construction applications and consumer products. Um, the most important uh, types of coatings are galvanizing, but there are other coating technology, and particularly hot dip galvanizing, electro galvanizing. Um, and it um, leads to a product with, uh, for all practical uh, purposes, um, corrosion uh, free uh, behavior. It uh, achieves this at low cost, and it doesn't have a big impact on the use or availability of that material as scrap. So it, the material is very re still very recyclable. So we'll be talking about uh, the forms of corrosions that are important uh, for, for uh, steel, so-called cosmetic corrosion and perforation corrosion. And uh, we'll also review the most important types of uh, coatings that are currently being used in the industry. Uh, in addition, we will uh, review what are the main methods to um, produce these, uh, this strip. All right, let's uh, get started. So um, these are typical products uh, that are uh, used in the uh, coated uh, form, uh, uh, car body uh, materials. You, are, you have side panels. This is a um, part of an exhaust system, muffler, of a um, a um, car. This is a, a luminized coating very often. These here are uh, washers um, and uh, they are uh, you use uh, very often for consumer products for reasons of superior visual appearance. Um, you use electro galvanized uh, materials, sheet material, and this is a typical uh, constructional uh, a part uh, panel that is um, also galvanized. Okay. Now, um, in the past, uh, when uh, particular automotive products were uh, sheet products were not uh, galvanized, there was um, considerable concern about uh, the impact of uh, corrosion, hmm? and um, uh, you had first of all the unsightly um, type of. Um, cosmetic corrosion, such as this filiform corrosion here on painted panels. And in wor wor uh, worst case, uh, you had actual uh, total perforation of the, uh, the panel uh, by the corrosion, which is, of course, a, a very um, uh, more concern because the structural integrity of, uh, of the car, in this case, is, is uh, being um, is damaged. Now, so what you've seen in the previous images is that um, when uh, steel s uncoated steel starts to corrode, you develop a very large amount of brown and black uh, corrosion products. Now, um, uh, in addition to this uh, visual, uh, to the fact that you we are able to suppress corrosion, there is also another thing that's important. It's the visual appearance of the, the corrosion or the damaged uh, uh, area. For instance, uh, this gives you an example of a standard cold roll uh, sheet. Uh, it's been uh, painted with a um, automotive uh, paint system 
uh, which we'll say a few things about in a moment, and uh, scratched, so damaged. And, um, and you can see that you get uh, a, a lot of uh, red rust that's being developed during a so-called salt spray test. Uh, you do the same on a uh, sheet that is uh, now covered with a thin micron thin uh, layer of uh, zinc and you see that first of all there's much less corrosion product and then the corrosion products are um, white and finally you can reduce the rate of the corrosion rate uh, by in using instead of using zinc you use zinc alloys and in particular uh, two alloys uh, are currently uh, being widely used one is most widely used is iron zinc alloys, which we all so refer to as galvanized, and iron and zinc nickel alloys. Mm -hmm. And you can see here, you can see here uh, again the same uh, type of panels: scratches applied, damage applied to the panels, and the um, the corrosion product. And you see much much uh, less voluminous, much less um, uh, corrosion. So it, and, and the paint adhesion is also uh, very good. So, what um, causes, uh, what is the cause for the um, the corrosion? What, what are the, the corrosion uh, mechanism? Well, you get um, certainly a, a painted panel. Uh, usually, a, a, a cold rolled painted panel uh, will consist of uh, uncoated sheet surface. The top of that will be some kind of conversion coating. That's usually uh, phosphate, uh, inorganic phosphate layer that is used as an ad adhesion layer on which you uh, apply a primer coat, yes, a primer coat, and that coat, on, on top of the primer coat, you apply a top coat, which is usually colored. Hmm? Right, so at scratches, at these uh, scratches that you just saw in the panel, you get uh, formation of oxides, hydroxides and oxides of um, iron as a consequence of the uh, interaction of the steel surface with oxygen and water. Note that um, these organic paint systems are permeable. So that means that uh, they uh, pick up oxygen and water molecules and these oxygen and water molecules can diffuse through the organic paint layers and react with the uh, the iron there, mm -hmm. and then lift off the um, the uh, the paint layer um, as uh, the oxide is formed or the hydroxide is formed because of the, the 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 large volumes change associated with the formation of this oxide. So what happens? We have so two steps. You have first of all cathodic disbondment. Uh, the oxygen and the water uh, pick up. Uh, electrons uh, to form OH minus um, ions, yes, and these um, uh, uh, ions are provided by the reaction of dissolution of iron. So the iron goes into solution and forms electrons, all right? Um, the oxide, okay, now, so we have um, hydroxide and oxide and, and uh, iron in solution. So next step is oxide lifting. Uh, you will form corrosion products and they will accumulate under the, uh, the coating. Hmm? So, uh, so the you form an oxyhydroxy uh, compound of uh, iron, usually complex, rather complex uh, phases here. Um, and uh, eventually you form uh, the uh, magnetite or hematite, depending on the conditions, at the surface of this uh, these hydroxides. All right, and that lifts up the the, the paint film because of the large volume increase. All right, and um, th this was a, a schematic. You can see the same thing here, uh, but now you have zinc. So now you have this is the place where you sc uh, you have the the, the, s the steel surface. And in this case, we have a, oh, you can see it better here, you have a zinc uh, layer, which was originally going from here to here, yes? 
And you see now that instead of uh, forming iron oxide, the, you have corrosion products which only contain zinc oxide. Yes. So there is no attack of the steel anymore. We, we, ha we get what we call cathodic protection, and uh, it is the zinc rather than the iron that goes into subduction. Yeah, so that's the, um, the, uh, the mechanism of corrosion protection in this case. Yeah. So the coatings that uh, we apply are typically either zinc, pure zinc electro coated coatings or hot dip uh, zinc coatings. Yeah. So the first coatings uh, have a typical coating thickness that goes from two and a half to about 15 microns per side. Mm? So we're talking about 20 to 105 grams per square meter of zinc. It's a very small uh, amount, mm? as you can see. Um, um, hot dip uh, zinc coatings uh, are used in the constructional industry and in automotive application. In constructional applications, we have to guarantee long-term corrosion resistance. Mm? And so the coating thicknesses can be very high, mm? 700, so one, two, 700 to uh, uh, up to 700 gram per square meter. So you're looking at 50 microns of uh, zinc per side. In the case of automotive steels, um, very important are the cosmetic corrosion and the perforation corrosion. And you can guarantee this at much lower uh, amounts of um, zinc. Mm? So you have the so-called GI coatings, that is galvanized, regular galvanized coating thicknesses. Thickness of the layers there are 6 to 20 microns per side. So we're talking about 40 to 140 grams per square meter. Or you have galvanized coatings. Galvanized coatings are uh, zinc, iron, alloy coatings. Zinc, iron, alloy coatings, yes. Uh, uh, which, as I already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, have the property that the corrosion rate is slower than the case of pure zinc. Mm -hmm. and, and there the, the coating thicknesses are typically slightly uh, lower, 6 to 11 uh, microns per side or 40 to 80 grams per square meter. Mm. Right, so what do we see? Obviously, uh, if we do a test where we measure the time it takes to see red rust appear at the surface of a test panel that I showed earlier, and we set the uh, reference amount at 5%, it comes as no surprise that the thicker the layers are, the thicker the layers are, the longer it takes for red rust to appear. Hmm? So this is the, in the x-axis, the coating weight, yes. Um, but we see, what we see is that zinc alloys, such as zinc nickel and zinc iron, uh, require much less coating thickness, so if we, coating thickness, to achieve a much larger uh, time, uh, duration of um, time to, uh, to red rust formation. Hmm? Um, I would like to uh, mention the fact that zinc nickel and electro galvanized zinc, pure zinc, are applied by electro galvanizing techniques. And so that means that the you can uh, achieve a very nice compact layer uh, at a very well controlled thickness and a small. So these two, um, the electro galvanized coatings tend to be on the thin to very thin side, 20, 4, 20 to 40. Uh, milli uh, grams per square meters. Hot dip galvanized, uh, you have uh, a lot thicker uh, layers, as low as 20, and but can be very high in the case of constructional applications. The um, what is also important is to realize that uh, we're talking about a great improvement of the corrosion rate. Uh, or the absence, almost absence of corrosion, but 
um, in normal circumstances. Hmm? So if you, um, if, if you uh, look at the corrosion rate of zinc at in very acidic circumstances or very alkaline circumstances, the corrosion rate is high. Hmm? So we're talking about regular atmospheric corrosion. In that case, hmm, we have a really low corrosion rate of the zinc itself. And again, the, uh, the, 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 what, the, what the, the zinc does is basically offer galvanic protection to the, the iron. All right? So let's have a look now at our technologies that we use to apply uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the zinc. We can uh, first have a look at the electro zinc uh, coating, uh, coatings. And uh, what, what you basically have is a, a number of um, cells, electrolytic cells, through which you, uh, you pass the, uh, the strip. Hmm? So uh, the strip comes from the uh, annealing process. So the, uh, to have annealed uh, cold roll strip. Hmm? So the material comes in at this end here, it's get uncoiled, and uh, you can form an endless strip of material hmm? endless, uh, by welding uh, coils to one another, uh, welding the, the, the head of a coil to the tail of another one. Hmm? When you're doing this welding, uh, the strip is stationary, so you need to, to have an accumulator at the entry of your uh, line. The uh, uh, strip must be, so the, uh, you have a, a decoiler, a shear to get a nice uh, straight uh, edge of your um, strip before you can weld it. You join it, you go to accumulator. You need a pre-cleaning, yes, to remove any, th any residual iron fines or carbon deposits which may be on your strip. And then you go through leveler, a leveler is uh, basically a, a unit equipment that uh, uh, gives you a very flat uh, surface. And then um, you, you have electrolytic cleaning, so that removes all the residuals at the surface. Rinsing. You start by activating the surface by pickling it slightly, so exposing it to the uh, electrolyte uh, before you, uh, you pass through the cell, zincing cells, and you have quite a lot of cells because the strip um, uh, velocity is quite high and you can only deposit uh, that much during the residence time of the strip in, the, in these cells. Mm -hmm. um, you can end up, uh, so once the, uh, the strip comes out of these cells, you can do phosphating, chromating, dry, and then you have an exit accumulator. Accumulator to inspect the surface of the uh, the material you just made. If necessary, you will uh, shear off the the, the edge, hmm, side trimming, oil the strip, and then coil it. Hmm. All right, there it is. So this is what it looks like uh, from the exterior. What these cells look like from the exterior. Not much to see. On the interior, the cross section looks like this. This is for technology uh, where you use a sulfate electrolyte. So these cells are very big, uh, eight cubic meter typically. Uh, they use up lots of current, about 150 amps per square um, decimeter. And the strip velocity is very high, 200 meters per minute. So the residence time of the strip is, is relatively short. So ha what happens? The sheet uh, comes out of one um, cell, goes over a conductor roll, yes, into the, the electrolyte and then over the other co bottom conductor roll and then back uh, out of the cell in the electrolyte. Inside the cell, we have uh, on the way down, the, uh, we have um, electrodeposition of zinc between the strip that is negatively polarized and these insoluble uh, titanium iridium oxide anodes, yes, which act, uh, yeah, 
and so you get you deposit zinc or zinc alloys out of the strip in the going in going up all right there are different uh, types of uh, coatings as i said um, the main ones are uh, this one here that's just pure zinc pure zinc uh, the uh, next most important one is zinc uh, nickel and uh, nickel and um, there is also possible but there's very limited supply of uh, zinc iron coatings and that's that's their the morphology um, uh, surface morphology of these uh, uh, coatings on the other side of the, uh, the technologies to apply uh, coatings on large uh, surfaces you have um, the hot dip uh, method where you basically dip the strip in a molten uh, bath of pure zinc or an alloy of zinc or an alloy of aluminum because we also uh, uh, put aluminum and aluminum alloys on strip surfaces um, this is uh, uh, phase diagrams for uh, iron zinc so um, and the uh, composition of the coating for pure zinc galvanized is indicated of course at 100% zinc galvanized has about 10% of 10% um, of iron or 90% of uh, zinc and um, you can see that in that case uh, I don't have a solution of uh, iron in zinc but I, I have a Intermetallic and that intermetallic is uh, the name is called delta iron, uh, delta, excuse me, delta, the delta phase. Hmm? In the case of uh, zinc, so you can have zinc, pure zinc, uh, zinc iron alloy coatings, you can also have uh, zinc aluminum coatings. And uh, there are, if you look at the phase diagram, you have two uh, important classes of. Um, zinc aluminum coatings that's uh, the so-called gal fan which has about five percent of aluminum and you have gal volume which has around 50 percent of uh, aluminum yes and finally the uh, last but not least important uh, type of coating on uh, steel strip was aluminized and in this case we can have pure aluminum coatings but uh, the ones that's uh, most often used is the, the so-called aluminized coating and and that one has this eutectoid eutectoc, eutectic excuse me composition of about 11-12 uh, percent of silicon yes um, rather than uh, pure uh, aluminum all right now there is a very big difference a uh, very important difference between te uh, electro galvanizing technologies and uh, hot dip technologies and uh, that's the following in an electro galvanizing uh, cell uh, you you cannot uh, or in electro galvanizing line rather you cannot apply uh, an annealing treatment. So the annealing treatment can be done by batch annealing or by electro uh, by batch annealing or continuous annealing before you apply the the coating. In the case of hot dip um, galvanizing coatings, uh, whether they're um, galvanized, galvanized, or um, galvan, galvalum, or aluminized coatings, um, you combine the annealing and the coating together so that makes for a really nice and compact uh, solution mm -hmm. so your your entry material is what we call full hard cold roll strip mm -hmm. uh, which gets annealed and then coated in one go mm -hmm. so how does this um, uh, work well you this is a, a technical drawing or less of a um, hot dip galvanizing line mm -hmm. Um, which has uh, 
the following section. So the strip is uncoiled, yes, and goes through a first uh, furnace here, which we call a direct fired furnace because the, the flame, uh, the, the strip sees the, is exposed to the, the, the actual flame of uh, the burners, yes. Um, and then goes into a radiant tube furnace. So as the temperature increases, we uh, do not have a direct flame, but uh, the, uh, the flame is put into uh, big tubes, yes. And um, the, um, and it is the, the, the radiant heat from the tubes that heats up the, uh, the strip. So you, you heat up the strip, yes. Uh, to high temperature at which it recrystallizes, and then you cool it down after recrystallization, yes, and a uh, slow cooling section, and then a fast cooling section. Yeah? And the, um, then you can have an over aging section, yeah? where, uh, which is sometimes necessary for carbon steels to precipitate carbides, which may otherwise, if you didn't precipitate, would lead to carbon in solution, and as you know, that gives rise to um, um, Luders bands, and these Luders bands in, in press forming are the cause of um, uh, press forming uh, surface problems. And then the strip goes into the, a zinc pot, a big um, pot, which contains hundred tons of liquid zinc and you you dip it uh, you dip it into the zinc. Mm -hmm. After that the uh, you can go through a galvanilling furnace yes the strip is cooled to make the galvanilling furnace being used to make a zinc iron uh, alloy strip is cooled and water quenched so it's uh, at room temperature and then there may be some post processing of the surface. So this is a perhaps more visual uh, part um, uh, image here. So this, this shows you this radiant tube furnace. So you see these tubes, yes? This, tube, this is a picture. And inside these tubes you have the gas burners. So the, uh, and that gives you the, the heating by radiant. Now, why would you not, um, why would you go from a um, direct fire furnace where the, the strip sees the, the, uh, the burner flames to one where there is no, uh, well, because um, you need uh, to prepare the surface for the, the hot dip process. And the way you do this is by making sure there's no iron oxide at the surface. So in the radiant tube furnace, the, uh, the gas atmosphere is reducing towards iron oxide. And how do we achieve this? Well, the same way you achieve it in a, in a batch annealing furnace, the same way you achieve it in a continuous annealing uh, processing line, uh, you just have a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen in this, in this furnace. And typically, so you have most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and you have five to typically five and then to maximum of 10% volume percent of hydrogen in this furnace. And that's, that's enough to guarantee that all the iron uh, is 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 present as elemental iron. The uh, the cooling systems here. You have a fast cooling system. The typical. The reason why you need the cooling. Well, because the um, the temperature at which you do the recrystallization or other things, uh, as we'll see in uh, later lectures, um, is is of the order of 800 degrees C. Hmm? Take. Yes, and so you need to cool to the temperature, the strip, cool it to the temperature of the zinc pot, which is typically uh, 460 degrees C. Mm -hmm. And so you, do, you need to do this cooling in a controlled uh, manner. Um, so you need some fast cooling here. This fast cooling, you basically have jet of this uh, nitrogen, hydrogen uh, gas that uh, blows cold uh, gas on the strip surface and the temperature. Uh, as you do that, of course, you introduce a lot of gas in the furnace, so you also need uh, not only to have blowers, but also have um, uh, gas removal uh, uh, ducts in your, um, 
in your at that position. So the the strip then comes out in the, uh, comes out via a snout, yes, into the liquid sink. Mm? It goes around this uh, this roll here, this, this so-called sink roll, and then goes back up, yes, through to galvanizing or a uh, cooling section. So uh, so this means that um, the uh, strip surface is continuously protected from oxidation from the air through this snout. In the zinc pot, uh, uh, we have some reactions we will discuss in a moment. And when the strip comes out, it's covered by a thick, relatively thick layer of zinc, liquid zinc, which is blown off by a gas wiper. And you can then measure the thickness of the, uh, the zinc. And then either you make pure zinc and you just basically go straight to the cooling section, or if you want to make the iron uh, zinc reaction, yeah, iron and zinc, to form the delta phase, yes, and galvanized, then you, you go through the galvanizing furnace. This is what the uh, equipment looks like in practice. Here you see the snout, the strip comes out, is inside the snout, goes down into the liquid zinc, comes out here, here we have the equipment, you can't see it very well, equipment to, uh, the, the, the gas wipers to control the thickness. And, and here you can see the, um, the, 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 the pattern of the zinc flow, uh, which is wiped off the surface of the strip uh, as the strip comes out of the, uh, the, uh, the, the zinc bath. And this is the, the strip as it looks before it, um, it uh, solidifies and cools down. Hmm? There are lots of things happening around uh, this um, um, uh, galvanizing. looks very simple, but it's uh, relatively uh, complex. And so uh, you need to uh, take good care of, the, of what happens in the zinc bath. And so we, we talk about zinc bath management. So uh, first of all, um, some of the iron, as the strip goes into the, the zinc, some of the iron dissolves into your zinc. So the, the zinc bath is uh, saturated with iron. Yes, that's one thing. The other thing is the zinc cont contains a little bit of aluminum. And it contains aluminum because we want to make a so-called inhibition layer. When the strip goes into the zinc bath, the aluminum in the small amount, a few tenths of a percent of aluminum that's in the zinc, reacts with the steel surface. It's rather surprising, but the, um, the, uh, the very small amounts of aluminum will react first with the iron rather than the iron reacting with the zinc. And that's a good thing because this covers the strip surface that goes into the zinc bath almost immediately with a thin layer, very thin layer, of um, Fe2Al5. And because this layer prevents the reaction of the and iron, we call it the inhibition layer. Hmm? We form this layer to avoid the iron-zinc reaction in the zinc bath. The iron-zinc reaction gives rise to the formation of very big intermetallic crystals and which are solid and um, uh, at the temperature and uh, make a wiping of the, the zinc off the strip surface very difficult. So you, you, you have very poor thickness control. Okay, having said this, um, you do have a bath now that contains, of course, zinc, iron, uh, saturated amounts of iron and aluminum, which we need to make the uh, inhibition layer. So um, inside the bath, you have, you form dross particles. Mm -hmm. And these are typically um, iron Fe2Al5 particles or delta particles, delta particles being iron uh, zinc um, compounds. And so you have to be very careful that these particles do not um, um, interfere with the uh, stability of the, the hot dip process. Um, right. The way you do this 
is by making sure that um, you control the iron and zinc, excuse me, the iron and aluminum content in your zinc pan. So what do you uh, typically have in terms of the uh, phase diagram? Well, you have to look what uh, phase diagram you have to look at, the ternary uh, zinc iron aluminum phase diagram. And um, of course, you uh, need to look in uh, the uh, zinc rich corner of this diagram at the temperature at which you do the uh, hot dip galvanizing, which is 460, 465, typically. And um, so the, the composition of, of iron yes, in the zinc bath will be close to saturation. So this, this is this region here. Yeah, this region here is has liquid iron with iron in solution and amino in solution. And so we typically have zinc baths with uh, this composition, about 0.14% of aluminum and about 0.2% of aluminum. And um, why do we have to? Well, if we want to make pure zinc coatings, we need to make a very uh, stable uh, inhibition layer. So we'll have a little bit more aluminum. If we want to make intermetallics, in a controlled way in the galvanilin furnace, then we uh, do not want to have very strong inhibition. We only want inhibition of the iron zinc reaction in at the surface of the strip when we uh, put it in the zinc bath. So um, we only use about 0.14% of aluminum in this case. Hmm? Okay. So uh, uh, th this is the difference, right? You have compositions for galvanilin or zinc bath are about for galvanilin are in this region bath composition for galvanizing are in this region hmm? okay so um, the aluminum um, is as i said reacts with the uh, iron to form fe2al5 so you're basically using up the aluminum in the zinc bath so you need to constantly keep track of the aluminum content that it doesn't decrease. Uh, hmm? so, uh, so how do you do add this addition, the aluminum? You can pre-melt the uh, aluminum or, or zinc aluminum uh, small ingots in a separate induction melting unit and then add the liquid to your zinc bath. Or you can add directly small zinc aluminum alloy bars to the, um, the zinc bath as you uh, during the process. Hmm? Now you as I said these uh, zinc baths are uh, very large they will uh, contain a, a large uh, couple of hundred tons of uh, liquid zinc. Yes? Um, you would imagine perhaps that the uh, there would be a very large differences in um, temperatures in these uh, zinc baths or a very large uh, differences in aluminum contents in these zinc baths. That is not the case, actually. Hmm? If you um, measurements and also calculations show that uh, a, a zinc bath that is, for instance, a set for a temperature of 450 yes, is indeed at the temperature of 450. Hmm? It's uh, a little bit warmer there where you introduce the strip and a little bit cooler there where you introduce the, uh, the zinc aluminum um, uh, ingots, bars, to keep the uh, aluminum content constant. But otherwise, it's um, pretty much uh, the same with the aluminum content. If you set a uh, uh, a, a, your aluminum level at about, in this case, 0.5, 13, about 0.13, it is close to 0.13 everywhere except there where you introduce your, um, your aluminum um, so that the, the concentration of aluminum doesn't, doesn't go down. Hmm? So it's actually very homogeneous in terms of temp temperature and in terms of aluminum distribution. Hmm? Okay. 
Um, temperatures of the zinc bed, uh, composition of the zinc bed is constantly monitored, yes? Yes. Uh, we need to do that uh, because uh, you need to know how much aluminum is in solution, yes? And that needs to be uh, uh, controlled. So, so how do you do this? You, you sample the bath as you go in the process. Um, and uh, when you do this, you, all, you will measure um, uh, the, the total aluminum content. So that includes um, uh, inclusions, precipit uh, yes, precipitates, dross particles, etc. Um, and um, so, if you that, so if you take the samples at different positions, what you find is a, a line in terms of their aluminum content and iron content in this case, and the uh, the effective content of aluminum, i.e., the aluminum content in solution, is given by this point here. So um, it's very important because this point is determined the intersection of this so-called stoichiometric line and this solubility line, hmm, uh, you need to know exactly what or very well what your bath temperature is if you want to follow up on this, this parameter because that's the important parameter. That is the aluminum content that the strip sees when it's dunked into the aluminum, uh, into the zinc bath. Hmm. Um, a few more words about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the strip. Uh, the stripping of the zinc. So when the strip comes out of the uh, uh, zinc bath, it has a the zinc thickness, zinc layer thickness is very high. It needs to be reduced in a controlled fashion and you do this with these air knives. Hmm? And you can control this very well. Hmm? Uh, thicknesses within a few microns of th uh, can be controlled. The thickness can be controlled uh, within a few uh, microns. So, so you can have 10 to 100 microns. Uh, very uh, nicely controlled with the system. Um, so th there are many things uh, happening at the surface of your strip when you go through uh, this uh, hot dip galvanizing line. You have uh, uh, processes that happen at the surface of the strip um, and at the interface between the strip and the zinc layer. So when you, you go into the, the furnace, you have iron oxide reduction. Uh, whereas iron gets reduced in an uh, annealing furnace, uh, alloying elements such as manganese, silicon do not get reduced. They, 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 they are oxidized. Hmm? Um, so you make a selective, we call this selective oxidation, that process. Yes. In the snout, the strip is exposed to metal, zinc metal vapor. In the zinc pot, as already said, the dissolution of the strip surface and you form the inhibition layer. When you go out of the zinc bath, the wipers will uh, control the thickness, the final thickness of the layer that will solidify. And then if you wish to make an iron zinc, zinc iron rather alloy at the surface, i.e. do galvanilling, you need to do an inhibition layer breakdown and the zinc iron reaction by reheating the, f the, the strip with an induction heater heating to about um, 500 or slightly more degrees C. Hmm? So this is what the uh, typical thermal treatment would look like, thermal cycle rather, of the strip. So you heat up, recrystallizing heating, you get soaking, cool down, and then you can have hot dipping in the zinc bath and then reheating to galvanilling temperature, around 500 degrees C, before you cool down the strip to room temperature. Hmm? There are, however, many different types of uh, thermal cycles. If you, if you end up working in this field, you'll see that. Um, it depends very much, again, on the product portfolio that a, a company has and um, at, the, at the time the, uh, the line is designed. So you have, uh, lines which have overaging, so where you have a longer time, where you keep the strip at a longer time around 400 and 
20 degrees C so that you get precipitation of carbides, formation of carbides, yes, and your, your material has, it isn't so sensitive to aging. You have lines without overaging, which process mainly interstitial free grades. Hmm? Um, and you can have uh, lines where the overaging temperature is slightly different than the traditional overaging uh, temperatures because you're making special types of advanced high strength steels or a combination uh, where you uh, can cool below the zinc uh, liquidus temperature and then reheat uh, so that you can dip um, a strip that's hot enough in the, uh, in the zinc bath. Let's have a look now at our galvanilling uh, situation. So when you, when you start the, if you want to make a zinc iron intermetallic, you have to start the reaction between iron and zinc. So you reheat this, the, the, the zinc layer and what happens? You start, this is the surface of the, of this, of the material and this is the cross section. Yeah? And what you see in cross section, you see that uh, you have outbursts of the uh, outburst types of uh, reactions. Yeah? And that happens after the inhibition layer has broken down. Yeah? And you can see uh, these crystals are um, very long and they, they can go pass through the, uh, the liquid the metal uh, liquid zinc surface. After a while, um, the, um, the coating surface contains essentially these zeta crystals that you said surface. Uh, but if you look into cross section, you have mainly the delta layer yes uh, in, uh, in the coat. So there's a difference between galvanized and galvanized in that with galvan galvanized, your coating consists is mainly a zinc solid solution with a little bit of aluminum and iron, yes. And at the interface, there will be an inhibition layer, which is essentially Fe2AL5. In the galvanized, it'll be very different. You'll have on top of the steels, you'll have a series of intermetallic phases, zinc iron intermetallic phases that are, um, and, the, uh, and the delta layer being the, the most important ones. Hmm? So you have a gradient, but you do have a gradient of iron content in this, uh, in this coating. Hmm? This um, uh, inhibition layer that we, uh, we have in the galvanized products is very thin, yes? It's it's um, this is um, this is wrong here. This shouldn't be uh, millimeters. It's of the orders of um, microns. Hmm? Actually, half a micron. Yes, hmm? yes. It's typically I think about hundred nanometers. Yes, hundred nanometers. Hmm? This is the what happens during the uh, iron zinc reaction. So at the beginning you have pure zinc. As you do the the reaction, you you can s you could start seeing the, the crystals developing in the liquid zinc, and when the um, uh, reaction is finished, you have these uh, big uh, zeta or delta crystals uh, at the s that you see at the surface. So during the reaction, the zinc is being used up. Zinc, you form zeta layer that then disappears, and the layer that forms where you form the largest amount of is the delta layer. If you continue the, um, uh, the annealing, you will see that the gamma layer, the amount of gamma layer or the volume fraction of gamma layer increases uh, tremendously. And that you don't want to have because it's a very brittle compound. So uh, we usually stick to about 10% of iron in the coating, i.e most of the coating is delta phase. Hmm? Why don't we want to do this going beyond the 10%? That's because if we go beyond the 10%, the powdering becomes very important. This gamma layer um, is the source of powdering. And what is powdering is it's when you, when you um, 
press form a galvanil panel, and there is too high an uh, iron content, the powder uh, basically delaminates, yes, and, uh, and is removed during the press forming. So you don't want this to happen, and you can guarantee a low rate of powdering if you have uh, around 10% of, of iron in your, um, in your coating. Other coatings uh, that are alloy coatings is the 5% uh, aluminum coating, which is called Galfan. This is a eutectoid uh, coating. You can see it here. Yes, it's um, used. Um, it's uh, so the, the the matrix is zinc, and the darker areas are uh, aluminum rich. Yes, and uh, and it's a lamellar microstructure. It's uh, the big advantage of the Galfan is that the um, the uh, the Galfan doesn't the coating doesn't fracture as easily. Mm? It's, uh, zinc uh, is uh, uh, um, a coating have a tendency to fracture more easily uh, during deformation. So um, hot dip coatings, uh, alloy coatings uh, that are not zinc type are the aluminum 10% uh, silicon alloy coatings that are used for high uh, temperature applications. And those have a uh, uh, basically a dendritic uh, matrix of aluminum. And then at in between the dendrites, you have an aluminum silicon eutectoid. And you see here also we've, we have a intermetallic, that's also an inhibition layer, which in the case of the uh, aluminized coatings is a iron aluminum silicon um, intermetallic. Again, it prevents the, f the, f the formation of a, f a strong reaction layer between the iron and the aluminum. Mm -hmm. In addition to uh, metallic, pure zinc or zinc alloy coatings, um, what uh, the steel industry provides are uh, sheet materials which, which are color coated, which, uh, which uh, are coated with an organic paint layer. Mm -hmm. So in this case, for instance, you have the sheet, uh, the strip material, will be covered typically with a zinc coating, yes, metallic coating. And then on top of this, you will have a pretreatment, which uh, takes care of, of the adhesion and provides uh, some additional corrosion resistance, a primer, yes, and then an organic top coat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the uh, organic top coat is very often only applied on the side, on the, 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 the visible side mm -hmm. of your uh, visible side of the panel and um, not on the back side of the panel. Mm -hmm. There you, you, you can have a back coat or, or just a primer. Okay, these um, lines um, for the organic uh, coatings are also continuous lines. Um, they are characterized by uh, two important elements. One of them is the um, the unit that applies the paint layers. You, you have um, uh, two surfaces, and you have a, a primer uh, layer that you have to apply, and then the top coat. Yes, this is such a um, uh, paint uh, 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 coater, strip coater. And uh, the other thing that you need to have is a, um, a unit, a furnace, where you do the curing of the paint systems. Mm -hmm. So you need to cure the, the primer and, and then the, um, the uh, regular top coats. Paint systems are uh, very varied uh, uh, objects of study. They're very important in many application paint systems. Uh, there's constant development in paint systems, uh, one of them being that um, you make the paint coatings um, uh, give a certain degree of catalytic protection to the steel. This is an example here of such a coating where in the uh, the matrix, the binder matrix of the coating, you have uh, zinc particles, which provide some 
level of cathodic protection to the steel, uh, basically allowing you to use cold rolled steel without, um, uh, without zinc uh, uh, coating in principle. Um, what is um, very important also, in particular for paint systems, are, is the phosphating step. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but uh, it basic, why is it so important? It's because it provides basically the adhesion uh, between the, the zinc layer and your, uh, your primer layer. And you can see here um, uh, zinc, uh, these are usually called triphosphate layers on different types of zinc coatings. Hmm? So um, let's just uh, conclude this um, lecture on um, uh, coatings that uh, for cosmetic and perforation corrosion protection of steel, we have an array of uh, metallic and organic coatings, yes? Uh, both for hot uh, strip products and cold strip products. I didn't talk about the hot strip, uh, but you can also uh, zinc coat hot rolled materials, and we discussed the different coating technologies. Yeah? Um, we also discussed the particular difference you have between uh, galvanized and galvanized coatings, it's relatively important in fields such as automotive uh, body materials, where, where um, these materials are used. Yes, and um, it goes without saying that uh, the um, uh, zinc and zinc alloy coatings is really important in the steel industry because uh, they um, have allowed uh, uh, the steel industry to, to put uh, uh, sheet materials that's basically uh, very, very um, corrosion resistance in, in many um, applications. <laughs>